Hey, welcome back, people, to my channel here. This is Stephen Witsit, your host with Middleism Apologetics. And today, wow, um, I'm responding to a video of uh, Jason Acosta, you know, and the I.O. thing. Um, that was done maybe about two years ago. Um, but you can go on his thing and you can see all the crap that he puts up with and, and uh, all the videos he does and uh, the wild claims that he makes that nobody can refute him, that... He's got the ironclad everything, and, and nobody can do anything um, to refute him. Um, I'm going to show you a couple things. Uh, first of all, this channel is a theologically focused teaching channel. People, let's listen to him for a second. He says this is theologically focused, okay? I want you to go and look at his opening video. I seek to be as unbiased as possible in my studies and teaching on the Bible. Thanks again. All right, let's listen to him. And uh, let's go look at Well, hello and welcome to my channel called Consistent Preterism. My name is Jason DaCosta, and thank you for stopping by today. Uh, I am not a pastor. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a teacher. Um, maybe I am a teacher. Uh, I probably won't ever author any more books, to be honest. I'm just a regular guy who enjoys regular things such as sports, eating, traveling. And that's what he does. He presents himself as, oh, so they, but, you, you know, the perfect little gentleman and all that kind of crap. Um, the man is about the most vile, vicious uh, person that I've ever met when it comes to attacking people who attack him. Um, whoops, my camera here. Let me fix that a little bit. The guy is just, he is the king of uh, sarcasm, the king of um, bad uh, comments and, and everything else. But that's because he's not saved. So what always baffles me is somebody here who says he's not saved, that he is um, not, his name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All of that thing is past and whatever happens to us happens afterwards. It has nothing to do with God and, and the Bible or anything else like this which means he has no clue as to what is going on. He doesn't need Jesus, um, so he's not saved. There's nothing about him that, that, uh, that qualifies him at all to be a teacher in the Bible if he doesn't believe it as being what it is. Now, uh, he's also a preterist, and full preterist. Full preterists, no, I'm sorry, they do not, twice now this is, full preterists are just as terrible as Mormons. Um, full preterism is completely heretical in all of its forms and even here he calls it consistent preterism because he thinks that uh, the consistent view is that all salvation if, if uh, salvation has come, Jesus came the new heavens and earth arrived the great white throne drum was complete and everything else, then nothing else afterwards matters uh, not a thing so you know when we go through scriptures and we look at it and we read about how much God loved Jacob and he, Jacob, or God loved his people and God uh, did these things for his people and inter interacted with people all the way through. And, he, and in that he included uh, Gentiles and anybody who was of faith in him, he brought them in. Anybody who acted in faith, such as uh, Ruth and Rahab uh, from other surrounding nations that were not descendants of Abraham. And he included the, these people into uh, part of and made part of them uh, of Israel. Then the, the idea comes across very simply that uh, he cares about all nations, anybody who has come to faith in him or believes in God and is willing to include them into the family of God. And it's Romans 11 that talks about uh, Gentiles being grafted in. So anybody who's of another nation who believes will be grafted in. Um, this is the consistent storyline of, of the whole Bible, um, which he denies, of course. Uh, there's a pattern of, of him starting out of uh, all the nations and, and from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob all the way through Moses, 
of him calling out people. But the promise to Abraham, of course, was that I will make you of a great nation and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Um, not all the nations that have... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll get into that later. He's, he says some of the most stupid, vile things I've ever heard in my life. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at that. And uh, let me switch over to where we're actually going to be. And uh, let's see if we can get this. There's Sometimes when both of these are going on, my software here, it, it, it slows this down. So I don't know what that really is. But... Uh, what we want to talk about, though, is in like in Genesis 10 and some of the other places, it says that all the nations shall be blessed. So how are all the nations blessed? Well, of course, Jason wants to narrowly define things and redefine things. And so all nations means any nation whatsoever that is not Israelites or descendants from Abraham um, can be blessed because the, the narrative is, is that Christ has come to save people from their sin. And we'll look at that a little bit more closely. So um, his 70 ID doctrine is, is full of crap. Um, I'm looking at my notes here. But basically says after AD 70, uh, there's nobody's name is in the book of life. The book of life is all finished up. And he admits at one point that that's even what his futurists believe, that everything comes to an end. So that's why he calls himself considered and says futurists are stupid because we don't understand the timing. Uh, but as Jason admitted, he's not a theologian. He's not a scholar. He doesn't know anything. He reads the Bible at Holiday Inn and thinks he um, understands it perfectly, and he does exactly what Don Preston does, is find this scripture, that scripture, and then piecemeal together. Um, but when you actually listen to his wording and his explanations of these things, you can see that he completely twists things and destroys it because he has no spirit within him to give him life uh the bible is a living book breathed on by god made alive by the spirit and he doesn't have the spirit so he can't not make it alive um boom sorry um there's nothing nothing good about jason de all right with that said i'm going to start into i've got notes listen people i am going to be here for a little while i'm going to warn you now i am because i'm not going to take my time I'm taking my time. I'm not just going to skip through things real quick. And we're going to deal with what the things that he says. So let's start with uh, right here at uh, the 27th. Two minute. others who are not descended from Israel. Again, we're going to show that to be incorrect. Uh, Greeks, they say whenever the Bible mentions the word Greeks, uh, that it's talking again about the dispersed Israelites who happen to be living in Greece. What a poor misrepresentation that is. That is. I've never said that before. Uh, I have said that the converted ones that we see where the gospel converts the Greeks, um, those are indeed the uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel because that's the... See, the play in words. Uh, let, let me go back and I'm going to show you what he Tom, uh, Tom said. Um, he said it specifically. After listening to my audios, uh, then he cannot be trusted. Okay, then he's, he's a pure, bold-faced liar. And it certainly isn't applied to others who are not descended from Israel. Again, we're going to show that to be incorrect. Uh, Greeks, they say whenever the Bible mentions the word Greeks, uh, that it's talking again about the dispersed Israelites who happen to be living in Greece. Okay, he's saying very clearly, uh, this Tom, he says that when the Bible talks about Greeks, according to I.O., when it mentions the Greeks, it's talking about spiritual Israel, or not spiritual, excuse me, the lost sheep of Israel who have been dispersed into those countries. Like they are Jews and Gentile uh, Jews that are in Greece, that are living in Greece, and they have become and married and part of the pagan culture of Greece. Now he says this in his video, um, and that's exactly what Tom is saying, is that that's what I O believes, is that these people who are called Greeks are not really great Greeks. They are Israelites who have been paganized and are living in Greece. Now listen to DeCosta's response. What a poor misrepresentation that is. That I've never said that before. Uh, I have said that the converted ones that we see where the gospel converts the Greeks, um, those are indeed the uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because And that's exactly what Tom said. 
when those Greeks are being converted, those Greeks that are converted are actually people of the house of Israel who are living in Greece. It's the exact same wording. This is the double tongue uh, of Jason. Double tongue, um, unstable in all of his ways. Because that's the overall mission here when it goes out to the nations to gather the elect in. Of course, uh, yes, that is the case. And just because they call themselves Greek has nothing to do with where they came from and their heritage and who they dispersed from. Okay, I want you to remember that very closely. What he just said was, it has nothing to do with their heritage. Because they're Greeks, uh, living in Greece doesn't mean that they are Greeks. But here's the problem with that. In the dispersion, and he will talk about this later, and this is the double tongue, that they became pagans by living and marrying within those cultures. They married Greek people. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me show you the clearest example of what we're talking about here. This is Acts 21. Greek. Okay. Uh, oh, that's not 21. Um, 18, I think it is. Let me get back over there to it. I'm not looking at my notes real close. Pretty sure it's 18. No, 17 or 16. Keep going. Sorry about this. I thought I had it. Okay, here it is. Uh, Paul came to Durban to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So the question is, would Timothy be considered a Jewish descendant or would he be a Greek because of his father was a Greek? Well, when we're discussing later on about Timothy, Timothy was not circumcised. Therefore, he would not have been considered a Jew. He would have been considered a Greek because his father was Greek. So here's the the Jewish mixture that was going on in these different countries. Um, some of them marrying, some of them like Priscilla and Aquila, two Jews that were living in Rome. Um, they become Roman citizens. They are con called Roman citizens. Like Paul was from Tarsus. He was a Roman citizen, um, but then living, his descendancy, of course, was Jewish heritage. And so what he I always teaching is that these type of people are still the lost elect. They are of the lost 12 tribes. They are still uh, the lost sheep of Israel. Paul called himself a Roman, but that doesn't mean that Paul wasn't an Israelite. So these terms are more associated with their citizenship and their cultural beliefs and where they lived um, more so than where they actually came from. As he himself even admitted just re just uh, previously, there was a dispersion of Israelites, actually many dispersions of Israelites throughout this story. Uh, and just like uh, Genesis 48 predicted, uh, Ephraim's descendants would become a, quote, multitude of nations or multitude of peoples okay so when you uh, see all these Israelites being pushed out into the nations throughout the entire Old Testament um, and then you you come to the New Testament and you see uh, Paul going out to the Greeks and preaching uh, the gospel and telling them that they're saved from their transgressing of God's law um, you have to sort of be able to put this together and see the big picture all right and I'm gonna add something to that shortly but let's continue with his final uh, I think it's his final gross mis misrepresentation here. So. But Tom was absolutely correct because he just confirmed it. He said it is about people that are in other nations that are descended from Abraham that are living in Greece. They've married Greek people. They have married and intertwined with the, with the culture and the things. They still understand they're, they are descended from Israel, but they are also Greek. Now, here's the basic truth also that's got to be remembered. Um. Anybody who descended from Moses was given the law. They had the law of Moses because the law of Moses was given to, given to Israel 
and to its descendants all the way through. That never ends. That's what defines a Jew is he a descendant of Abraham. He was given the law, whether he follows it or not, pays attention to it or not, honors it or not. He is still a descendant of Abraham. That makes him part of the elect of, uh, of Israel. But New Testament terms, the elect goes on to anybody who has the faith of Abraham in Christ. And that means anybody. You do not have to be a descendant of Israel in order to have faith in Christ and be grafted in and part of Israel as a whole. Because the idea is, yes, Israel is God's chosen people. And right now, they are under a blindness and a curse until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Which means that full number of Gentiles, people who are not descended from Abraham. All the others but have the faith of Abraham. We'll get into that a little bit more later in just a minute. Um, I want to, I'm looking at it. And uh, what I'm going to do now is, in, in response kind of that, let's go to Acts. I'm going to show you some things, and we're going to work our way through Acts. And this is kind of what will take a little bit of time. Um, I want to show something here. Okay, And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You will be my witnesses. You will testify and be witnesses to who Jesus is, that he died, rose again, and was resurrected. So he said, go to the house, go to the lost sheep of Israel, right? And he's talking about within Israel. That was Jesus' ministry. He was called to go to the lost sheep of Israel. He was not go, called to go to the Gentiles and to other nations and to people everywhere else. Lost sheep of Israel. And that's what he's quoted, of course, there in Matthew. Uh, or, J you know, Jason does. So they're told to go to Jumir, uh, Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, Jason wants to define this simply as going to the lost sheep that are scattered among these nations. And it has nothing to do with uh, anybody else who is not a descendant of Abraham that is being called. So uh, that is what we're going to be talking about. Because here's the problem. In Acts 2, Jer Jer Jerusalem, there were Jews, devout. Multiples came together and they were amazed. Sometimes. Are these not who are speaking Galileans? Don't we hear in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Fergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all parts of the world belonging to Cyrene and to the visitors from Rome, both Jews bum, ba, da, dum, and proselytes. Proselytes were never, ever other Jews, lost Jews, or somebody else who was a descendant of Abraham. Proselytes were always people on the outside who wanted to follow the Jewish religion. They were never, ever uh, descendants of Jew. Let me, let's see if we can go a little bit beyond that and I will show you. Um, what happened here? Wrong verse. Okay, no, there it is. Jews and proselytes. So it's the right verse. Oh, come on. Quit taking too long. Let's go back. It is the right one. Just that they used a different word in that NIV. That was NIV's, NIV's tr NIV is trash um, in so many different places. And converts to Judaism. Now, let's look up this word proselyte and exactly what this means. And both and converts. Okay. So let's go to 4339. What is a proselyte? Proselytoi in Greek. Come on. Let's move. I keep forgetting about this. I wish there was, I'm getting a new computer. So that should help. 
I'm getting a brand new one. Should be arriving sometime today. Uh, one who has arrived at Judea and proselyte. One who has arrived at proselyte. Literally, that has come to a proselyte that is a non-Jew who has been circumcised and has adopted the Jewish religion. Do you get that, folks? Look at that. I owe people. Pay attention. A proselyte is a non-Jew who has been circumcised and has adopted the Jewish religion. So that is who is in uh, Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Now, if this is true... then we have other people from other nations who speak these other tongues who are not descendants of Abraham. That's the key. They're proselytes, non-Jews. They're converts to Judaism, meaning that they were circumcised and are following the law of Moses. So this is who's in town. All these people are in town. And what happens? You go through, he, he teaches, and what happens? Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Repent, be baptized. You and your children are far off. God calls him. And with many words, he bore witness. Save yourselves from this cooking. So those who received his word and were baptized, they were added that day about 3,000 souls. So you're not going to tell me there was no proselytes saved. It doesn't make a distinction. Very well could have been very much proselytes, non-Jews, who were saved on that day. And I'm, I'm going through my notes here. I want to make sure I come through. I don't want to spend forever, but uh, we want to look at some things. Now, the narrative I'm building up is you're going to see a progression of them speaking to Jews and to Jews and to Jews, and then all of a sudden, now Gentiles are included, and we're going to look at what Gentiles were. Well, let me just say for the record, uh, Gentiles is a Latin word, of course. Jason will admit that. It means people of other nation who are not descended from uh, Abraham. They are not Jews. They are not Judeans. They are not Israelites. They are not of anything of the 12 tribes. They have nothing to do with being um a descendant of Abraham. That's the bottom line of what a Gentile is. We're going to listen to some of his remarks a little bit later on, and he'll lie about that. You will hear his lies about that. Now, he's preaching. I'm looking at my notes. I want to be sure. And uh, 4, verse 4. For it was already, but many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men that came was about 5,000. Peter and John before the council, captain of the temple of the Sadducees, came, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus that resurrected him from the dead. They arrested him, put him in custody, for it was that evening, but those who had heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to was about 5,000. So now you have about 8,000 people in Jerusalem who have become Christians. Um... Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing before him, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, what are we going to do? Inhabitants of Jerusalem, they cannot deny it, can they? Cannot deny it. They recognized they were being with Jesus. Uh, and they threaten, threaten, no matter of saying, okay. They play, pray for boldness, and everything was in common. The full number of those who believed were heart and soul uh, to the resurrection of Jesus. That's just an off-color by Apostles Barnabas, which was the son of a, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, um, the city of Cyprus. He was a Levite living in that city. This is another thing that gets pointed out quite often, is that here again, you have a Jew who knows he's a Jew living in Cyprus. Get it? All those people you saw there, were they knew they were Jews living in other countries. What else is very common about Acts? Well, we'll see that a little bit later, that Paul went to the synagogue first. Let's go on. Nine. Oh, eight. I'm supposed to be in eight. Let's go up there then real quick.
Let's get it on. Boom, boom, boom. Come on, baby. I could do it one other way, but... All right, you have the stoning of Stephen and all that would go on on. Here's what I want to point out in 8. Now, the church has been centered around Jerusalem. 8,000 people have been saved. They're all there. They're building up the church in Jerusalem. What's going to happen next? Well, Saul proved the execution of Stephen. And so there went out a great persecution against the church of Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So you have these Christians getting scattered everywhere. From Judea to Samaria, point in, important point. You're going to, I'm going to build up step by step. Now, what else happens then? Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed that to them the crowd, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. They saw the signs and spirits and everything else, but it still doesn't say those are Gentiles, does it? Doesn't say anything. It's just the crowds. We're building. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that the Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. So who are Samarians? Who are these Samarians? Only the Christians that were in Samaria? No. We just read that they, they scattered into Samaria, but they preached in there, and more Samaritans were being saved. Ooh. They sent them Peter and John. But see... Um, I'll we'll get to it later. But Jason points out that the Samaritans. I wonder if I put that down in there. We'll see it a little bit later. Uh, were Samaritans were not were not Jews, and so he argued in the video. He says, "Well, Jesus said I'm going to the last sheep, but then he says go to uh, Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world." Well. That's a contradiction. How can he go to the lost sheep of Israel, be told to go to the lost sheep of Israel, but then they're told to go in Judea and Samaria and preach the gospel to other people that are not Israelites? Well, that's a contradiction in him. And he, and, and he doesn't grasp it. He does not grasp it. That the whole time that the message, and Jesus came to save the whole world, not just Israel, through Abraham's seed, who would be Jesus, he came to bless all the nations. We'll get into it a little bit later. I'm working. I'm building this up. So, 14, right? Now, when the apostles heard that Samaria had received the word, they sent them Peter and John, who prayed for him. Okay? Still doesn't say anything, does it, about non-Jews. Now, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He came to Jerusalem to worship. So that's more than likely a Jew, right? We wouldn't argue with that. They came, that's what happens. They would come to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. We can believe that. But he took it down. Do you not know Ethiopia has been in Christian country for thousands of years? Anyway, let's go to 19. Or chapter 9, excuse me. Verse 19. So Saul is converted. All of this goes on. And we want to point out. For I will show how much you suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed into the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you in the road by the grave sent me to his death, and he gained your sight and filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell on his eyes, he gained his sight and rose and baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was dis with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying he's in the Son of Man. So here's the idea that I want to get across, and we're going to repeat this. Paul, on all of his journeys, being a Jew, would go to the synagogue. Now, uh, did I make that? I did. I mean, I didn't know if I wanted to bring it up just yet, but uh, probably. Uh, I'm seeing. I should, um, in in Luke. For example, where did I put it in my notes? Okay, yeah, I did. Yes, yes, Luke 16. And let's go to there real quick. Um, Luke. Verse 16. Or, excuse me, chapter 30, 16. Well, I'm supposed to be at work today, but I took a day out because I just ain't feeling all the greatest. 
and so instead I'm here making a, a video okay Luke 16 let's see where uh, tch, tch, tch. yeah I hope I got it the right one Or is it Luke 4, 16? I can't read my own handwriting half the time. That's my problem. Yeah, it was Luke 4, 16. My fault. Okay. As he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as was the, his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Now, here's the background for that. And this would be for Paul, too. Whenever a rabbi, a visiting rabbi, would come to a place or his home or anything else, there was always opportunity for them to be able to read. And they would be asked to read. So here Jesus gets up and he reads, of course, from a Hebrew scroll, and he reads the Isaiah passage. Um, and he taught their synagogues being glorified. Sabbath day, he came to the synagogue. I wanted to point that out. They always go to the synagogues. Paul all the way through Acts, goes to the synagogues first in each one of these places. And that is kind of what is going on. Now, going back to Acts 10. Now, this is the, uh, the idea here. The conversion of Saul um, and Cornelius. On his way, men are he to Jerusalem. He approached the mask and sent a light from heaven, and he, and he was brought down. He was taken there, scales removed from his eyes. Now, what had, happens next? He, he was with the disciples of Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He's the Son of God. This is what Paul did. And people were heard of him and were amazed, and here he is. Uh, Paul saw him increased in more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the not the Christ in our English, but the Messiah. That was the point of his preaching to Jews. Jesus is the Messiah. Then he escapes. Verse 20, But Saul increased all the more strength, confounded the Jews who lived in men, by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Okay? I'm trying to be careful with my notes here. Then what? 20. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and said, Who are the Hellenists? Uh, so he went in among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. Well, these are Jews that are like Hellenists? Hmm need to keep that in mind. 34. Uh, Peter went, who lived at Lydia. There he found a man named Aeneas for bedroom for eating. He was paralyzed. paralyzed. Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. And he made your bed. And, rose. and all the residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. So this still is all very much could be and is to other Jews living in these other cities. 45. Nope. Any, I don't remember now what that one was. All right, we'll go on to the next chapter. I'm showing you through Acts is what I'm trying to do. Then Peter and Cornelius. Now, here's the interesting. Uh, Cornelius. Cornelius, he stared and terror. What is it, Lord? Uh, your prayers and alms have sent a memorial before God. So here's a man who they claim was an Israelite, who was a centurion. According to the centurion, what was known of the Italian cohort, a devout man. So Peter goes to him and does what? I have not anything that is common or unclean. So God is made clean, do not call common. So we know that other people of other nations are considered unclean. How do we know this? And they said, Cornelius is in turn an upright guy from him who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. That distinction means that Cornelius was not part of the Jewish nation. That is the implication. That's what we understand. 
was directed by the Holy Spirit and Andrew sent to you to come to house. So he invited them in to be guests. So when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter Levin says, no, no, I am too a man. And he talked with him, found him a person together and said, you yourselves know how unlawful, what law is that? Well, against the law of Moses. It is for a Jew. And that means an Israelite, anybody descended from Abraham, to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. Of another nation. So we're talking about descendancy. He used Jew. And that's what Jason talked about. Remember, descendants of, of Jews, even though in their other nations, they are still descendants of Abraham. That's what makes them Jews. But here, it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or clean. So now, all of a sudden, he's declaring here that people of another nation who are not of the nation of Israel are now can be called clean. Why? Hmm. So Peter opened his mouth to speak to these people. Um, and you know that happened, and we witnessed and both did. But God raised me not all people, and he commanded us to preach. To people to fast that he is the one point by God to judge the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness, and who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So Peter, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit on the and the believers from among the circumcised, circumcised, not uncircumcised, but circumcised, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Anybody who is non, non-Jew, anybody who is not descended from Abraham is called a Gentile. A Gentile is never, ever a person who is the lost sheep of Israel. That is the basic lie of Jason DeCasa. That's the stupidity. Uh, there is no theologian, no scholar who ever said a Gentile means uh, they are of the nation of Israel or descended from Abraham. Uh, that's the bottom line on that. Bottom line. So when he says that Gentiles, well, we'll hear a little bit more of it. We'll hear. I'm building up the case. So let's go on to chapter 11, 18 to 26. And they glorify, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. He has granted repentance that leads to life to the Gentiles. Again, the argument was from the beginning. Heard that Gentiles had been received the word. So when Peter went the circumcision party, criticized him. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Oh no. Gentiles are uncircumcised. Get that down. Understand that. This is not about Jews. Timothy was uncircumcised. But his mother was a believer and a Jew. Interesting, right? Okay. Um, now, those who were scattered because of the persecution. Gentle grand. So, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that rose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Why is that interesting? To no one except Jews. So they weren't preaching to other people who were not Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Syria, who, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. So now they're preaching to Hellenists, people who are not Jews. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Bar Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came, he saw the grace of God. He was glad, and he swore them all to bring him faithful, which dead had purpose. For he was a good man, full of the whole spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And it goes on. And it was at Antioch. The disciples were for, called Christians. Um, so there you have it, folks. No, to no one except Jews, but there were some who coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, not to the lost tribes of Israel, not to lost sheep, not to people who were paganized or anything else. 
uh, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with him. So, again, let's go on. Persecution also starts by Herod of the church. Uh, and we get into 13 here. Now they were, they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who's called Niger, Lucian, Cyrene, Manning, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Lucian of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Hmm. What for? Fourteen now. Now Paul and his companions had set sail from Paphos and came to Perga to Pamphylia. John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went unto Perga and came to Antioch. And on the Sabbath they went into the synagogues and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the song sent a message to them saying, "Brothers, if you had any word of encouragement for the people, say it." So here's that invitation again. When a traveling rabbi or Pharisee comes in. They will offer them to speak. Do you have a word of encouragement? And so now Paul stands up and begins to preach. Um, he gets all the way down. The, as they went out, the people begged that Jesus, that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting, the sun God broke up. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism. There it is again. There it is. Proselytes. Devout proselytes. Converts to June followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The whole city gathered. The Jews saw it, were jealous. Um, and Paul and Barnabas spoke up. It was necessary the word of God be spoken first to you, Jews, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Now get this. If they were sent to the lost sheep, and they come to the Jews first at the synagogue. Those Jews reject him. Now they're going to the Gentiles. Now they're turning to the Gentiles. Why would they be turning to the Gentiles if they were sent there for the Gentiles? Do you get that? If the Gentiles are the lost sheep, then that's why they were sent. Jason will repeat this. That was their mission. That was why they went into the other nations. Was to reach the lost sheep of Israel who are living like pagans. You're going to hear it later. But instead, what? Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. Again, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying God, the word of the Lord, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. This is elect. We're appointed to eternal life. That's the election again. And this is not of the lost sheep because they were already part of the elect family and as many as were appointed to eternal life appointed as were appointed to eternal life believed uh, and so this word of the Lord was spreading throughout the city Jews inside doubt men standing and leading men stirred up persecution against Paul, against Paul and, and drove them out um, again hmm 14.1 now, Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Okay, here's he in a synagogue, and now both Jews and Greeks believed. Okay, a synagogue was the church. It was not the temple. Were Gentiles, other people who were not allowed to go into a synagogue, most synagogues were almost outdoorsy. They didn't have four walls, most of them. They were outdoors, and this was a form of entertainment for a lot of people who were not religious and believe, but they would come and listen to people preach. Uh, their former TV back then. Uh, so now, he spoke the synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. It doesn't say in both Jews and lost sheep of Israel that are living like pagans or anything else. He says in Greeks. Nationality, they are Greeks. Timothy was a Greek, but he was also a believer. His mother was a Jewish. Does that mean? 
But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles. See, there's a contrast. Stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against their brothers. Huh. Poisoned the mind against their brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly. Yep. Let's go on. We're still in 14. Let's go to 15. If it'll let me. Okay. Unless you are circumcised according to the customer, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas said no dissension between them. They talked about it. And Phoenicians were describing to the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great to the prophets. When you came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church. Uh, and the apostles and elders and they declared that God had done, and some who believed belonged to the people rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them to order them to keep the law of Moses. So, who are they talking about? Gentiles, people who were not circumcised, who were not living according to the custom of Moses. Um, but yet, the point was always in all of these little towns, there were synagogues. People know that they were Jew. The Levite from Cyprus. They knew they were Jews living in another nation in another time, but they still had their own synagogues that they went to. That is always the point. Gentiles, even if they were... Uh, okay, Gentiles then can't be the lost sheep of Israel. Can't be. Otherwise, they would still be going to church, to the synagogues. They knew who they were. Um, Timothy's mother went to the synagogue. It just baffles my mind. You can't get that. Um, 15, 14, and 21. What signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles? And they finished speaking. Jesus, James, brother said, listen, Simeon's really had God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. To take the Gentiles... To take them from, from them, a people for his name. So they're taking a people from out of the Gentiles and for his name. Christ visited the Gentiles, non-Israelites. I hope you get the implication. Take from them a people for his name. He took them as a people. He took the Gentiles as a people. After the start would turn, I would build the tents. I, re, I will rebuild the throne of the that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who will make these things no bone. Therefore, my judgment should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. This is not the lost sheep of Israel, but should write to abstain from the things polluted by idols and things. And so it goes on. That's the whole argument right in through this chapter. In verse 21, I think I read that. From an ancient generation, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he's read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So these Jews would have been hearing it from day one. You cannot tell me that they're all paganized. They're all following after God because they it didn't. They took pride in who they were. They were Israelites. They had their own synagogues. Um, ancient generation, Moses has been declared in every city they proclaim him. And he is read in the Sabbath in the synagogues. So you can't tell me these Gentiles are people who are the lost sheep of Israel. I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Um, let's go on. Chapter 16. Verse... What did it say in the... Paul came to Durban Lister, a disciple from, was there, named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers. So Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. So as they went on their way through the cities, that made him a, grip, a Greek. Um... I'm in 16 and verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, and the prisoners were listening to him. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. The jailer woke up. Then he brought him out. 
And they spoke the word of the Lord to him who were in his house. And he took them to see him by the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once. Then he brought them to the house and set foot before him. And he rejoiced with the entire household that he believed in God. Again, this jailer was not of the lost sheep of Israel. Seventeen. Now, when they had passed through Amphilia and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So Paul went in as was his custom, and on three seventy he reasoned with them, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. Uh, and some of them were persuaded and joined Paul, as did a great many of devout Greeks. Not lost sheep of Israel, not descendants of Israel or of Abraham, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. Why would they be jealous of their own people coming to the Lord? See, that wouldn't make any sense. There would be no jealousy if other Jews who had walked away from God, living like pagans, had come back to God. There's no reason for them to be jealous because they were still Jews. Um, yep. So therefore, again, there's the logic. Um, 17, 15, 16, I think it was. Those who conduct brought him as far as Athens after receiving command for Sarah came to pass since about they departed. Now, when Paul was waiting for the Athens, his spirit was provoked when he saw the city was full of idols. So these are so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Those who happened. This is not pagan, lost sheep of Israel. Some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. These are not Jews. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Hmm. They brought him before Agrippa. They talked. He Something new. Um, he goes and he preaches. And being then God's offspring, we ought to not have to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. But then God's offspring, we ought not to think the divine being is like gold. We are indeed his offering. Uh, and we live and move. So Paul's argument is, is that we are all offspring of God. We are all. Go back up and look. To the unknown God, whether you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. All mankind. Not just to the Israelites, not just to the last lost sheep of Israel, or to pagan Jews, but to everybody. Mankind breath. And he is made from one man every nation of mankind to live in all the face of the earth. And he made from one man. Who is that one man? Adam. Oh, oh, Adam. Why do I say that? Because good old Jason DeCosta denies that everybody came from. So let's look at something real quick for his. Because he's not a theologian. You got to remember that. He did never admits to being a theologian. So let's look at what the Bible says, and not Jason DaCosta, who lost it. Come on. Oh, come on. Screw it. Okay. Go down. The man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. By one man. What's that verse? By one man. Romans 5.12. What does it say? What in the world? Oh no. Let's go. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and this way death came to all people because all sinned. So get the logic of this. By one man, sin entered the world. Who? Adam. When did sin enter the world? Adam. 
he was the first one to sin. So death through sin, and on his and on this way, death came to all men. Do all men die? Is there anybody who is immortal who does not die? No. So if all of them die, it's because they have the sin nature within them, and death came through all men. So therefore, just sin came to the world through one man, and death through sin. So death spread to all men, because all of sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted with there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those over those who were sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. So Adam, again, Adam came in, so there's only, all men are sinners because of Adam. We all come from Adam. Hmm. For we are indeed his offspring. So he's making the argument that all nations, everybody who lives, came. And he made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So we're all descendants of Adam, having determined a lot of periods in the boundaries of the dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Do you get that? That's his own point that he's sitting there talking to these pagans that God pointed where you're at. He did everything in there. He's the king of the whole world. Um, He's appointed every nation of mankind to live in all the face of the earth. He's given you your boundaries, your dwelling places. He's the one who's done it all. And we are all counted as his offspring. Being then God's offspring, not Abraham's, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver. The times of ignorance is God is overlooking, but now commands all people everywhere to repent, including you guys. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by man whom he has appointed. And now this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So you guys will be judged. Even though you don't have the law of Moses, you are guys are what? Men of Athens? You are Stoics and philosophers? <laughs> Excuse me. You're going to be judged. How can you be judged if you don't have the law of Moses? Hmm. Now, when they heard of the resurrection, there's some mock, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. Some men joined him and believed, among whom also was Dionysius, their Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius and others with them. You got to look up what that is one day. Dionysius, he was one of the ones that was in charge of this area where he spoke. And so Dionysus was not a lost sheep of Israel. He was not a Jew. He was not an Israelite. He was not a descendant of Abraham. But they believed. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Let's go on. Okay, 18. We're getting to the end of this. Uh And they came to Ephesus, and he left there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a long period, he declined. But on taking his leave, he returned to God. So he landed in Caesarea. Again, he went to the Jews first. After spending some time, he departed went one place to the next to the region of Galatia, Perga, and strengthened all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollo, a native of Alexandria, a native of Alexandria. How do you become a native of Alexandria? It's because you were born there. But he was also a Jew. Hmm. Um, took him aside and explained everything. So Priscilla and Quilla uh, had been kicked out of Rome when Paul met them. Okay. And we're... Next chapter. We're coming down to the end. 19, 8 through 10. Let's look at this. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning, persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn, continued in unbelief, speaking evil the way of, before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks who were not Jews. They were not the lost sheep of Israel. They were Greeks from the nation of Israel. They were descendants of Greeks. They were not descendants of Abraham. Very clear. Hmm. Twenty-one. One more. 
Now, in chapter 21, was that 2 through 9 or 7 through 9? And when he finished the voyage from Tyre, he arrived at Ptolemus. He was greeted by the brothers, stayed with them one day. Sassari went to the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While they were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came. Um, I wanted to bring that up. The, the four unmarried daughters, they lived until after 70 AD. Shh, don't tell anybody that. Um, what else? That was two through nine. It's like you drew from to the hands of the Gentiles. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Boom, 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 boom. Who are the Gentiles? The lost sheep of Israel. When Jew, when, when, uh, <laughs> wow. Powerful stuff here, Jason. So when Paul went to Jerusalem, he was arrested by who? The Gentiles or the Romans? Who was he delivered to? The Romans. Who were the Romans? Gentiles. He, they delivered him into the hands of the Gentiles. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns his belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Wow. Uh, agreement he related by one thing that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now he goes through there. Now where it happens. For they previously seen trophies with them in the city. Uh, and when he came to the steps, he's actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. And as Paul was about to be brought into barracks, he said, May I have to say something? Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who recently stirred up a revolt of 4,000 men of Assyrians? I am a Jew from Tarsus in the city. A citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And he would give him permission, Paul was taking the steps. Mention with his hands beat, and there was a great hush, and he addressed them in the Hebrew language. Okay. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and as they were seeking him, the word came to the tribune of the court that all Jerusalem was in confusion. Soldiers and centurions ran down to him, and when they saw the tribune, the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. They arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Do you get that? He was bound over to the Gentiles which were identified as soldiers and centurions. They were Roman people, not the lost tribes of Israel. Um, that concludes our examination of Acts. And we're at one hour. Okay. Let's... All right. Wow. Let's go back to Jason. We're going to start now showing. Now I've established he goes to the con he goes to the Israelites, then he goes to the Gentiles, the people outside. All towns had their own synagogue. The lost sheep had their own place. They knew who they were. They were paganized, some of them, yes, but they knew about the synagogue. It was always there. They were never lost. They were scattered, but they were never lost. There was Christians all over the place. All right, now, Romans 11, 57, 39, uh, 37 to 39. All right, let's go through. And up to 37 and 39 is what we want to get to. The next section here. Let's listen to it. Take a second to load can say that there's a future end in sight somewhere down the line because if there's not a future end in sight then all nations got the gospel by the end and the only end which is when Christ returned within one generation of when he yeah, spoke well, these Christ didn't things. Return and as he said so in Matthew 16, he would return lot. before some of you standing here die. Here. Okay, so he did return when he said he would. And so Tom is stuck here as an inconsistent full preterist he says that the gospel's still going out today to, to many nations and the end the end has already come but do you see there's a contradiction there jesus says the gospel will go to all nations and then the end will come and that's why the gospel was urgent to begin with they were going out urgently to gather in the elect before his coming in the end of the age when they would receive and inherit their uh their promise and their inheritance 
So uh, big, big, big problems there. Now, uh, that also correlates with what Paul said in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, Paul is speaking to Gentiles and he's speaking about the Israelites. Now, remember, we have to remember that Paul is actually writing to literal Gentiles in every sense of the word, except for the fact that they were Israelites. Okay, and I'm going to... Except for the fact they were Israelites. He's writing to the Gentiles, but they were Israelites. Wrong. Let's go to Romans 11. I mean, I, I've never seen anything so stupid in my life. Um... So has God rejected his people? By no way. For I myself an Israelite. Uh, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. So we're talking about the elect are the ones who believed. Not all of Israel. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it. But the rest were hardened. So out of all of Israel, there was only the elect were those who followed after Christ. God gave them a spirit of stupor that their eyes would not see their ears and so that um, let their teeth become snare, let their eyes be darkened so they cannot and bend their backs forever. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespasses, salvation has come to the Gentile as to make Israel jealous. There's that distinction. You don't make Israel. See, if Gentiles are the lost tribe of Israel, they're still Israel. They are still part of the Jews. They are still descendants of Abraham. So you cannot make the distinction, say Gentiles are descendants, to make Israel jealous. They're still part of it. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles as much as I am to the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous. And thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from dead? If the dough offered as fruit, fruit is holy, so the whole is alone. But if the root is holy, so are the branches. So he brings into this, this idea that Jesus is a branch. The natural branches are cut off and thrown away, which is the Jews, period. All of them. All of natural Israel is being broken off. And who is being grafted in? Who are not the natural branches? Um, there I'm going graft them, but God has power to graft them in again. For you were cut off by what nature? A wild olive tree and graft contrary to nature into cultivated olive tree. How much more will these, the natural men, be grafted back in to their own olive tree? So lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of the mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And this and the Gentiles are not the lost sheep because they are still part of Israel. I keep repeating that. Don't you hear that? Uh, Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish the ungodliness from Jacob and Israel. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The new covenant. So as regards gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and call are irrevocable. So this is, you were once, they were disobedient, you were, were disobedient, now you've been consigned to, and you're part of it, and they will be given and grafted back in. So he makes the distinction between the two. There's nothing you can argue against that, that the natural grafted are Israel and anybody who descended from Abraham. Gentiles are not people that defend, descended from Abraham. Moving on a little bit. I think we can do that. Yes. Let's go to, uh, let's see. I want to be sure. He goes on a little bit more. Let's go listen to him a little bit more. I'm going to show you that in a second here. So he's writing to uh, Romans, okay, who have descended from Abraham. They were descendants of Israel. And he says to you, I do not want, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel, those living in Israel. No, it's not to those just simply living in Israel. It means to Israel anywhere, throughout any nation. Those that rejected, we saw it in Acts, those who rejected the word, those who rejected Paul's gospel message, those Jews who rejected it and fought against it. 
they are the ones that are being cast out. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Okay, and then he says, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So we see that Paul correlates what Jesus said perfectly here, does he not? He says uh, that he doesn't want them to be ignorant. Blindness in part has happened to those who live in Israel because remember, he's writing to Romans uh, and he said, He's writing to Romans, but he's talking about the people in Israel. No, 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 no. He's talking to the people that are living in Rome, to the Jews that rejected the gospel in Rome. Oive. As until the fullness of the ones in the nations has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. So there was a gathering of both Jew and Gentile. All right, both both were Israelites, but they were. See again, Jew and Gentile. Gentiles are both Israelites. But again, we showed you in Acts, the Romans, that the Jews handed Paul over to the Romans. He called them Gentiles. They were not part of the lost sheep of Israel. They were not Israelites. They were not descendants. That is how the word is constantly used. And, and Jewish law. Israelites and they were Gentile Israelites. There's no such thing as Gentile Israelites. Sorry. Um that's a bold-faced lie. They were elect Jews and elect Gentiles. Hey, they, the elect Gentiles. <laughs> yeah, we're Christian men who were not descendants of Abraham. But they all descended from Abraham. No, they didn't. And I, I showed you where they didn't. Um, they didn't all descend from Abraham. And, and now, Timothy's father was a Greek. He didn't descend from Israel. Uh, he was not an Israelite. Never called that nationality-wise. His mother was. So... Timothy did not descend. Luke did not descend from uh, the Israelites. Again, you have many examples. So he's gathering them in, and he says, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the ones out in the nations, until the fullness of you Romans comes in. And in that way, all Israel will be saved. So the fullness of the nations, the fullness of the Gentiles coming in, would actually contribute and finish off all Israel being saved. So Paul is actually calling them the elect Gentiles. He's calling them Israelites right there. No, he isn't. He's not calling them Israelites. He's saying in the grafting analogy, he they're being brought into and as counted as any proselyte would be counted as an Israelite because they follow the faith of Judaism. That is the whole point of everything that they're talking about is they're bring, being brought in to plain as day but people just want to twist it and don't want to let it say what it says and that's because you have no understanding it's because you're telling everybody else around all these doctors of theology and everything else you are not a theologian you are not a teacher you are not educated one iota in any of that you're not a scholar or anything else but you're going to sit there in your arrogance and tell all these people they're wrong because you understand it better and you are the only one who came up with this crap. And you're the one who's spreading this crap and destroying people's faith because you think you have it all together. And you're the smart but one. But notice that he links that to the coming of the Lord. So he says, all Israel will be saved by the time the deliverer comes out of Zion. Yeah, since we know it's in future and when God comes, all of Israel will be saved because they recognize who that, the son of man that they see coming is Jesus. And they recognize they're the ones who put him on the cross they're the the descendants of those that put him and, and have laughed at him and have derided him all of these years and they come to a point of mourning and repenting for that that's how all of when he will saved. turn away ungodliness from jacob and then he says for this is my covenant with them with who with jacob yet the whole point of romans 11 is that we are being grafted in I got That's Israel, Trust me. when I take away their sins. So who is the new covenant made with? Jacob, Israel. Who? And he misses that point. Let me point something out. Um, I wonder... Uh, tch, tch, tch. Let me go on a little bit more. Who is sins were being taken away? Jacob's, Israel's. That all came to its conclusion at the coming of the Lord which matches what I just showed you from Jesus in Matthew 24 when he said right. that the gospel would go to Let's all go to nations, 
you could say the gospel Pause. would go to all Gentiles because Boy. the word is ethnos, both places. So the gospel will have gone to all ethnos, oh, no. and then come the on. end will come. It's the same thing as Paul saying the fullness of the ethnos will come in, and then the end will come, and all Israel will be saved. So everything wrapped Why? up at the end. Okay, all Israel was saved, which included all the elect Gentiles. There are no Gentiles coming in today because they were all saved by the coming of Jacob's Redeemer. Oh, come on. Okay, then we can go over to places like John chapter 6, and we can read John 6, where uh, Jesus says this. Oh, come on. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my... It won't pause. There it goes, finally. Okay, 2.12. My own will, but the will of him what? who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose oh, nothing, on. but should raise it up, there, up at the last day. Stop. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who stop. sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, I and I will this. raise him up at the last day. Come on. Again, showing that the conclusion and oh, all man. the elect were raised I've on the last day it. that's a conclusion statement just like i showed you from matthew 24 13 Stop. he who endures until the Stop. end shall be saved how are you getting salvation after the end that's a conclusion statement oh. same thing here in john 6 everyone who okay. sees the son and I believes to, in him may have, have everlasting life and i will there all right 212 i'll have to bring it back up again and we'll do that there all right let's go to romans 212 be nice to me. Let's look at something here in 2.12. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. So was the law given to the descendants of Abraham? Yes. That was Jacob. That was Israel. Anybody who's just, even the lost 12 tribes that were scattered abroad and back, brought back together afterwards, they became one nation again. Peter even says what? To the 12 tribes, they were all given the law. Anybody who descended from Abraham was given the law. So all who had sinned under the law will be judged by law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law that will be justified, right? For when Gentiles who do not have the law, they were never given the law. These Gentiles are being called and people said that you were never given the law. Therefore, they cannot be descendants of Abraham. If they are descendants of Abraham, then they were given the law through Moses to them. Got it? So for when Gentiles who do not have the law, neither are they circumcised, neither do they follow anything, by nature do what the law requires, they are law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show the works of the law is written in their hearts, and their conscience bear witness, and conflicting thoughts and excuses. So on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus, so he's going to judge them. Hmm. He is going to judge them according to what? The law that's written in their hearts while their consciences bear witness or conflicting through will they either accuse them or excuse them. They still will be judged. For all who sinned without the law of Moses will also perish without the law. Why? Because they still have to live according to their conscience. So all who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So even Gentiles who do it and follow it, they will be justified because they believe. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law of Moses. They still have a moral law that they follow. Um, let's get back into the thing here. And uh, go back. So again, we continue to prove that the Gentiles are not the scattered tribes of Israel. They are not scattered uh, people of Judea or anything else like that. Gentiles are always referred to as people that are other nations other than Israel. They are not descendants of Israel. I showed you the definitions. I've showed you everything that I can. All right, now we are... Hey, look, the law profit nothing, you know, like God has forgiven. Okay, good. Now, let's see. 
we want 44. We're at about 44. Let's get to here. And let's get to it. Verse 10 and forward, where Hosea is looking at the children of Israel scattered out in the nations, and he says verbatim, he says, uh, it'll be a great multitude that no one can number, all the children of Israel. Okay, so he goes to I'm sorry. Before. John heard the number and tells us exactly who they are, but then he looks, and what does he see? He sees the great multitude from all nations standing clothed, redeemed in white, saying salvation belongs to our God. Now, wasn't that Revelation 7 picture, isn't, wasn't that at hand when John wrote? Or is that future too? You see, Tom's got a lot of problems. He can either become a f futurist again and look forward to all these last day things and enduring to the end and, um, you know, the, the great multitude standing fully redeemed at the end or he can be a f like the sand of the sea a great multitude that no one could number 35. and then okay. there they are shown again in revelation 7 at the end of the story having redeemed having been redeemed standing in white inheriting their promise so big 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 problems okay um so again these border patrol arguments are ironclad nobody's been able to get around them nobody all right this is what takes everybody down and it takes them down in a blaze of glory which is absolutely asinine. He is so cocky about it. He thinks he's so much, but he still, he it is so easy to show him wrong. But you, you know, you can show somebody who's wrong, they're wrong in something, but they'll never believe you. He will never believe that he's wrong because he's perfect. He's right. He's smarter than everybody else. He's got it figured out better than anybody else. And so therefore everybody's wrong, but him. And that's why he pride. This fact alone sweeps all points off the table immediately. Wow. All right. Such I don't arrogance. even have to continue to address his points, but I will. All right. And so, again, I need to stress the fact that the borders are built. This story doesn't go beyond the coming of the Lord. All right. And that's the problem. The coming of the Lord didn't happen in AD 70, and he can't prove that it did. He can say everything he wants to, but everything that he proves about full preterism is an absolute joke. Of exegesis, he, they don't. It, did not just him, but any full prime from Don Pressman on through. Uh, full prime is a joke. So now, like he said, and if you listen to him, that's the one thing the future has got right is that all those things do end after he comes. But see, he hasn't come yet. So there's the big difference. Now, he's, uh, so he's talked about Deuteronomy 4. The, hmm. uh, even the futurist understands this, all right? The yeah, futurist see. wrongly sees that everything's in the future. They don't understand time statements. They don't honor Jesus' words. Um, and which has all been refuted and, and st stuck up his butt, and he wouldn't know it. Um, 47, I'm going to go to. Um. Now, before I continue and get into Tom's first nine points, I want to just call your attention to Deuteronomy chapter uh, four. Yeah, well, we already talked right? about four. Because what has to happen here is you guys have to have some sort of a uh, knowledge of what was predicted in the beginning. Now, if you haven't listened to my uh, audio from a few days ago on Deuteronomy 4, please do. But in Deuteronomy chapter four, we see Moses make a prediction about the latter days and the children of Israel being out in the nations, being paganized in those latter days. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 27 says this, And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, Israel, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all of your heart, with all of your soul. And when you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey come on, baby. his voice, there for the go. Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. So that is amazing because what it's saying there. Moses is predicting that the children of Israel, when he's, he's outlining this law to them, okay, the, this exclusive law that was only given to them, he's telling them to be careful, to take heed to it, to, to observe it, to cherish it, write it on their hearts, write it on their doorposts. It should be everything to them, right? He tells them that if they don't abide by it, they're going to be cursed. 
and this is what's going to happen. And he tells them that the Lord is going to scatter them among the peoples in the latter days. Okay, they were scattered, but they, they're they not called Gentiles. I'm sorry, Gentiles is a Latin word that was instructed by uh, translators. Uh, there are other nations. There's the nation of Israel, and then there are other nations that are not the uh, nation of Israel. And uh, so they will be scattered, but they are not being called Gentiles. Deuteronomy 4 never suggests such an idea. They're going to be left few in number in the nations where the Lord drives them. There in those nations, they're going to serve pagan gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither eat but here nor... But I also nor... showed you there was also the synagogues. Yes, there were some that did that, but the majority of them still went to church and to the synagogues in Philippi and Ephesus, Lystra, Derb. There were synagogues these men knew, just like Timothy's mother knew that she was a Jew. His dad was a Greek. They knew it. They lived it. They were not so paganized that they didn't know it. Israelites took pride in the fact they were Jews. Um because they alone had God. It just smells so, so in bigger. other words, Moses is saying, hey, in those latter days, you Israelites are going to be scattered out in the nations as pagans. Okay, you're going to be worshiping other gods. He's interjecting that whole thing that has nothing to do with Deuteronomy 4. It has nothing to do with them being, you'll seek the Lord your God and you will find it if you search for him. Uh, the Lord will scatter you. You'll be left few in number among the nations of the world, Lord, and you will, there and you will, and there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat. But there you will seek the Lord your God. Um, when you're in tribulation, all these things will con you in the latter days. You will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. Um, it's incredible. Incredible. Um, let me continue on. Okay, you're going to be you're going to be serving, uh, worshiping the work of men's hands, wood and stone. But from those nations, if you seek the Lord, you'll find him when you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days. When you turn back to the Lord and obey his voice, because he's a merciful. Okay, you'll Let's scatter go. all over the surrounding nations at that time. Then you can start to understand what Jesus is saying here. He's literally telling them to focus their entire mission on who. You guessed it, the lost sheep of Israel. See, now he's what he's doing here is he's going back to this lost sheep of Israel. He still wants to identify the Gentiles as the lost sheep of Israel. But Romans, centurions, and those that Paul was turned over by the Jews were not, they were called Gentiles. They were people of other nations. They were not the lost sheep. I mean, that one passage there says it so clearly and so profoundly. Um, and it shows Jason to be very, very ignorant, very ignorant. But why would Jesus exclude Gentiles and Samaritans there? Isn't that odd? Why would he say in Matthew 15, 24 as well that he came, quote, only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? I mean, why even say such a thing so clearly if salvation and the gospel was for the true Gentiles and the Samaritans as well, right? Isn't that kind of counterproductive to say such a thing? No, it's not, because the mission has always been from the beginning to all men, that all nations would be blessed through Jesus. So go into Judea, into Samaria, and preach the gospel to everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel message was for every man, woman, and child. Those that were under the law are not under the law. Those who were circumcised, those who were not circumcised. Paul makes those distinctions all the way through, and Jason is just completely oblivious to that fact. Consider this as well. Jesus told the exact same audience, the disciples, to go to Judea, Sumeria, and the ends of the land. For what? To gather the elect, correct? The Christian elect of those who believe, whether they're Gentiles or Jews, it doesn't matter. The elect are those who are called to faith, because I showed you in that other passage. That there were Jews who believed and there were Jews that weren't. The ones that were believed were called the elect. The Jews that believed were called the elect. Gentiles who were called to believe were called the elect. So wait a minute. Jesus tells his disciples to not go to the Samaritans and to not go to the nations in one breath. 
But then in the next breath, he totally contradicts that and says, go to Samaria. And the See, he calls it a contradiction because he's not theologically adept. He doesn't understand the context because he's turned it into I.O. To him, it's a contradiction because Jesus only came to pay, save Israelites and nobody else, nothing else. And that's the lie. That he believes. So therefore, anything that's contrary to that, he's going to say, well, that's wrong. you got to understand it differently. And everybody's got it all wrong but him. We've got it all wrong for 2,000 years, but he's got it right because he's consistent preterist. The ends of the lands to gather the elect? It makes no sense, right? <laughs> well, to you it doesn't answer. make any sense. The gospel mission was exclusively for gathering the elect. And guess who they were? Here's a hint. I come only for the lost sheep of the house of... Boy, he just harps on that lie constantly, constantly, constantly. Jesus sent his disciples out to get the Gentiles, people who are not, and proved it all the way through Acts. Israel. So Jesus tells them basically to not bother with the foreigners and the Samaritans, but to seek out the lost sheep of... Not to bother with the foreigners. Not to bother with the foreigners. Wow. Let me see something here. Not to bother with the foreigners. Not to bother with the foreigners. People who are not... Who are not... Who are not part of the lost twelfth. You're, you're, you're hearing him. He's saying that very clearly. Okay, so let's go back down through here. Um, oh, whoops. I meant Acts. I don't know how I got into Romans 10. Let's go to Acts 10. Okay, Acts 10. Hmm. He heard himself. He said foreigners. Um, he was from another nation. So what is that word for another nation? Verse 28. It is so easy to show him up for the fool that he is. Come on, baby. A little bit quicker. Come on. There we go. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Come on. We can do this. All right. Inner leaner. This is the Greek. What does it mean by associate with or visit a Gentile? To associate with or visit a Gentile. That's the NIV. Others say, you know, for a Jewish man to enter the Gentile home, associate with a visit to visit with another nation. Come on, we can we can do this. A person of another nation. He did that in three hours. I can do destroy his thing in in less time than that. Oh I you know he'll come back and say all kinds of garbage he will come back and try to refute things that I said. Or he just might sit there and say, I'm so stupid, it's not even worth repeating and arguing. And he won't bother with the specific arguments that I gave him. That's what's funny about him. All right. For a man to unite himself, come near to a foreigner. Right there. Do you see that? A lafalo. To a foreigner. To unite himself or to come near to a foreigner. To me... Answer, how God has shown not common or clean to call man. We are not to call any foreigner unclean. Other nation. So, hmm. What, what did he say? Let's see. Let's see. Where is he at? I want to go real close. Samaria and the ends of the land is to gather the elect. It makes no sense, right? Well, here's the answer. 
the gospel mission was exclusively for gathering the elect. And guess who they were? Here's a hint. I come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus tells them basically to not bother with the foreigners and the Samaritans, but to seek out the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then why did he command that they take the gospel to Samaria and the surrounding nations? The answer is simple. Because the lost sheep were there dispersed dispersed among them. The lost sheep were dispersed among, uh, among Samaria and among the surrounding nations. Jesus was very transparent about exactly whom he came for. He said it clear as day. When we get into Acts and Paul's letters, we see the ones out in these nations being saved. But, uh, come on. I'm just hoping for my new computer. Paul. There's ESV. Come on, come on. Buffalo, New York. I'm getting a phone call. Come on, let's go. I'm almost done with this whole video. Come on. Often contrast them to the elect Jews by calling them Gentiles because that's exactly what they were by every stretch of the word. <clears throat> but you can bet your bottom dollar that these were the lost sheep of the house of Israel that Jesus said he only came for. These were the pagan Israelites of Deuteronomy 4 that I showed no you in the beginning. Wow, where Moses on. predicted that back. in the latter days they'd come be on. out in the nations worshiping foreign gods. Come on. This is really, really frustrating that it does this to me. Wow. It is unlawful for a man, a Jew, to associate with a foreigner. Come on. There we go. Maybe we're going to do it now. Got that other one paused. So let's go back. Come on. We can do this. It's not that hard. Come on. There he goes. All right. So, you know, it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone from another nation. God showed me that I should not call anybody. Um, what is acceptable? But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable. In. So, we got Jason right there in an absolute bold-faced lie. He doesn't know his scripture. He doesn't understand Greek. He doesn't look at words. Gods and so he blew pagan it. idols. He's done. But God He's would have the mercy upon them his and remember the covenant that he made with their down fathers. Like a block of and as Paul said to the Galatian Israelites in Galatians chapter 3, if you are Christ's, you are, quote, Abraham's seed and an heir according to promise. So it didn't matter if you were a Jew. It didn't matter if you were a Greek. It didn't matter if you were... An Italian, if you were Christ, it was because you were Abraham's seed. No. <laughs> here's, here's the, oh, this is this is just classic. He's looking at Romans 4.16. Um, let's do this real quick. I got to do this. I got to do this. No, I almost forgot about this stupidity. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest in grace, oh wait, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness. So the Abraham and his offspring, which of course, all the descendants of Abraham, um, did not come through law, but through righteousness of faith. For it, if the adherents of the law were able to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings faith, but where there is no law, there is no transgressions. The idea is, is that um, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest in grace and guarantee to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also those who share the faith of Abraham, who is in the father of us all. See, he's trying to sit there and say it's only the offspring that share the faith of Abraham. But that's not the way it's supposed to be read. Um, not only to the adherents of the law, the idea is that those who share the faith of Abraham are also called the offspring. Anybody who has the faith of Abraham in God is called an offspring. And that's where that's where he is just totally uh, lost because he has no understanding. He just he has none whatsoever. Um, the Jew by their nature. This is very similar uh, in Romans 2. In Romans 2, 28, he says, a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, 
not by the written code. So here. So he's sitting there and he's admitting it, and he's talking about that scripture, Romans, that somebody who is a, a true Israelite is one who doesn't, who lives by faith, by the faith of Abraham, not necessarily by the law. You follow the law as a true Israelite and as a descendant, but it is by your faith in God that makes you a true Israelite, a real true descendant of Abraham, and, and in the same thing as Abraham. Um, so again, what Tom's not understanding here clearly is that Paul is always speaking of two different groups within the fullness of the elect. He speaks of the elect Jew, and he speaks of the elect Gentile. The, <laughs> the Gentile, of course, he defines it as somebody who's a lost sheep. But sorry, Israelites and Jews were... Coming into Christ together, but this does not remove them from the umbrella category of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember, there's a mission here that's being fulfilled. Paul is going out to the nations to gather the elect, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, so those elect who are living in the nations based on what I showed you from... Okay, I've had enough of this garbage. He's already... He's already seen it. Uh, oh, 141. Deuteronomy 4 were pagan. They were observing pagan practices, worshiping false... Here we That's, go. Everything 4 verse 13, it says, For the it promise that they he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. In other words, for the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but it was to his seed through the righteousness of faith. So it doesn't extend beyond the seed. It's See? There's the twist. That was the lie. It doesn't ex ex it doesn't extend beyond the descendants, and it does, because Gentiles were not descendants. They are not descendants. They were never given the law of Moses, because they were not given the law of Moses. They are not descendants. They are talking about people who are from other nations, foreigners. Cornelius was a foreigner. Peter called him a foreigner, somebody who was not of the Jews. <sighs> Somebody who is the lost tribe of Israel would be considered a Jew or, or part of the, the elect, period, because he was a descendant from Abraham. That is how you define Jews and Israelites. They are all descendants of Abraham. A G Gentile was never, ever, ever called a Gentile who was a descendant of Israel. P sorry, it's just not there. It's not there. Not... That's why they did use the word Gentile, to distinguish Israel as a nation and other nations who are not Israel. Always, always, always. That's why it's put in there. All right, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of him. Um, I'll end it there. And that one, what is it? Look at this. 3,623 views. So I'm going to upload this sucker, and I'm going to plaster it right here on his public comments so everybody can see it. I already put there. I lose. Yeah, well, we'll see if there's any replies from him. Um, wow. Okay. Thanks, guys, for listening, putting up. And 142. That ain't too bad versus his three hours of crap. All right, you guys have a good night. And uh, thanks for being patient and going through this.